So let's talk a little bit about your own personal habits around stuff. So let's start with metformin. We've talked a little bit about metformin. There are a couple of papers that have come out kind of recently that have suggested, hey, maybe metformin in the the metabolically healthy person and or the person who's exercising is either not effective or potentially blunting the effects of that. How are you reading those papers? Well, I thought what you wrote online was excellent. I think about the same way, which is we've known that one of metformin's main effects is to quote unquote poison mitochondria. It inhibits a a group of proteins that generates energy in mitochondria. And the response of the body when it has a bit of inhibition of this is to say, wow, I'm low on energy. Let's build up those factories. So mitochondria are often called the power packs or the battery packs of the cell. They generate chemical energy. If you're young or you exercise or you calorie restrict, you'll have more greater area or activity of these mitochondria. So more is better in general for humans. More mitochondria is good. And as we get older, we lose that ability. Metformin slightly inhibits that activity and the response is to make more of them. Problem is that if you're constantly inhibiting those mitochondria, that's not going to be seemingly helpful with this new study for building up mitochondria after exercise. Now, you could argue that maybe you don't need to have more mitochondria after exercise, but I think you probably would benefit from more mitochondria. So what you suggested that I think makes a lot of sense, though we need to prove this, or at least test it, is that if you're exercising, don't take metformin on the days where you do intense exercise, maybe the next day after, to let your body recover and build up mitochondria. This leads to something that I think is a very clear theme in all the work that I've done, the work that others are doing, and what you've been talking about, which is pulse your biological stress. Put your body in a state of anxiety or fear, adversity, but you don't want to do it all the time. Your body needs a chance to recover. If you want to take a supplement, maybe don't take it every day. Same with rapamycin. You don't want that on all the time. In fact, I wouldn't take rapamycin, certainly if I was exercising, because it's going to tell the cell to hunker down and not grow. And you may not even heal after exercise as well with rapamycin. So I think that the view that the combination of hunker down fast, but then exercise on alternative days, or take the supplement and then exercise on an alternative day, they make a lot of sense. Do you think anybody's going to be able to probe this? I mean, Nier is working on obviously getting TAME funded. And that's obviously asking a slightly different question that's really going after sort of a non-diabetic population. But is it going to be able to look at this? Do you think it will be able to tease out this issue that we're talking about? Or is the study not going to be structured to be able to answer this question? I've not heard of anybody who's testing that directly. Usually there's just one variable. And has this changed the way you take metformin? It has, but I need to put a caveat is that I don't take metformin regularly anyway. I need to find the right time to take it. And before I was taking it when my stomach felt in good shape. And you can tell when your stomach feels out of whack. Either you've eaten a big meal the night before or you're just not feeling right, a little bit of heartburn. Under those cases, I don't take metformin because it does a number on my stomach, which is great if you don't want to eat, but also I'd prefer not to always have a, a sore stomach. So I was already timing it. So now I just take metformin when I'm, I know I'm going on a long trip and I'm not going to exercise. You know, I'm on planes and trains. That's a good time to rebuild your body. And then if I'm at home and I'm exercising a couple of times a week, I'll lay off the metformin. And then what about rapamycin? Have you ever revisited that? I did take it just as an experiment, but haven't been taking it regularly. One of the things I do when I'm fasting is I'm not taking those things, obviously. So any period of fasting longer than a day, those things get stopped. Again, that's sort of a an idea that's not sort of supported necessarily by evidence one way or the other. When we last spoke, you were taking resveratrol. You noted that you were taking it with sort of a fattier meal. Is that still something you're doing? The evidence of resveratrol just continues to be good. It certainly does no harm. I do take it with my tiny bit of yogurt in the morning, which I make myself. I mean, I grow yogurt at home. I miss that. That does no harm. I don't have any negative effects. My cardiovascular system seems great. So, Do you think that resveratrol, like where do you think it ranks in sirtuin activators? There's others on the market out there. There's other supplements even like terastilbene that are sold that you can buy online. You very eloquently described the story. And if people haven't listened to our first podcast, obviously this is a great opportunity to hit pause, go back and listen to it because you talk about sort of the novelty of resveratrol and how it was sort of the first sort of built for purpose custom this is what it should look like. Oh, let's go get it. 
that's been over 10 years, hasn't it? Wasn't that like 2006, 2007? We first showed that it activated the enzyme SIRT1 and the SIRT2 in, in yeast, an extended lifespan. That was 2003. Jeez, yeah. So do you still think resveratrol is the best? If I, Because this is something I haven't done yet. I just haven't been able to convince myself that it's just one more thing I need to add to my already complicated regimen. And if I wanted to start taking sirtuin activators, would you recommend resveratrol? If so, at what dose? Or would you recommend I take something different? And again, you can speak to me and you don't have to give advice to anybody else. Well, yeah, I'd never give recommendations, but I continue to take resveratrol because it's cheap, it's harmless as far as we know. But the evidence keeps stacking up that long-term is beneficial. I mean, it's not going to cure diabetes. It's not as powerful in human studies or in mice as rapamycin. No question. But does it extend the lifespan of a mouse that's eating a Western diet? Absolutely it does. That's been done many times. It almost seems like it falls potentially into the metformin trap, which is the metformin data in metabolically unhealthy people. It's pretty hard to argue that metformin is beneficial. Paradoxically, the people who are most obsessed with this stuff are already doing so many of the other quote unquote good lifestyle things that it, you wonder, is it possible that you're already doing such a good job of all the other things you manage with respect to your health, that the resveratrol is neutral. Well, maybe if you're optimized like you are, I think, as good as it can get. But if you're elderly and you're not exercising, you're in a wheelchair, what else are you going to do? There is some data in my lab that I'll share with you that we haven't published yet, but I think it's interesting to mention. And I presented it at a meeting in Rotterdam last week for the first time to a big audience. So let me just tell the audience quickly what resveratrol is. It's a plant molecule, you get it red wine in very small quantities, but the amount that we're giving the mice and human studies, it's a lot. It's hundreds of times more than that. So, so you can't drink your way into enough resveratrol? No, but, you know, a glass of wine. But that hasn't stopped people from trying. Right. The molecule, I take a gram of resveratrol in the morning. It's a high dose. It seems to be fine. What did the ITP study way back in the day as a human equivalent, or is it too difficult to make that normalization? So ITP showed that if you have a healthy mouse on a lean diet, it doesn't extend their lifespan. Sorry, yeah. And then in your lab, you took obese or unhealthy mouse on crappy diet, extended lifespan. Well, it depends where you start the diet. It was extensive. It was 20, 30%, depending on how you count it. And the dose roughly was what? We did two different doses. They both worked. One was 24 mg per kg. Now one was 240 mg per kg. It's a big difference. That's a 10x difference. Yeah, right. And the lower dose was just as effective. What did the log higher dose do that the lower dose didn't? It kept the mice from gaining weight. All right. So you're closer to the 24 mg per kg. No, I guess you're, if you're taking a gram, yeah, you're sort of in between those, right? Yeah. It's on the high end. But the result is the following. We had a science paper published in 2013 where we went to the effort of making or finding, we searched for a mutation in the SIRT1 gene that we had published is likely the way resveratrol works. And that mutation blocked resveratrol's ability to activate the sirtuin enzyme. And that's been heavily debated and highly controversial. It's one of the big controversies in my career. So we were forced, if not encouraged, to do better. So we went back, we found this mutation that blocked the activation of this enzyme. And if we're right, then resveratrol won't work if you've got this mutation in a cell. And we found that was true. The drugs that were in development, the super potent ones, also blocked by this one mutation. What the mutation did was it made an enzyme that couldn't be moved. It had a stiff elbow, and without the bending of the protein at the elbow, resveratrol couldn't activate it anymore. And we know this very clearly. It's been well published and cited. But here's the big experiment, and uh, it's been 10 years in the making. You take the mutation, you put it into a mouse, not just a cell, a mouse. That takes a couple of years, took us a couple of years. And now we have a mouse that isn't normal. It's missing one amino acid in an enzyme that renders it susceptible to resveratrol. Well, worse, recalcitrant. It's immune to the effects of resveratrol in the test tube. And now we could repeat our 2006 study of the high fat diet with and without resveratrol and with and without this mutation. And I didn't know this was going to work. In fact, in the history of pharmacology, I don't know if anyone's ever found one amino acid change that blocks a plant molecule in the diet. Now, that's very difficult because in a diet, these molecules from plants are hitting probably hundreds of proteins. But we made this one change, and now we could ask the question definitively, if you give a mouse resveratrol, which benefits still occur? Yeah, what do you attenuate? But also, which are off target, which are working through something else? That's just as interesting. And I really don't mm -hmm. give a damn anymore about what the answer is. I just want to know. And so we did the experiment. My student 
pretty much definitively, I would like to hear anybody who can disagree with this statement, that resveratrol extends lifespan by activating SIRT1. And it begs the question, can we apply that to ourselves, which is during those periods of time when we are not fully dialed in, would we benefit from resveratrol? Well, that's the reason I'm taking resveratrol is I don't exercise. Do you pulse it as well? No, unfortunately, you caught me out. I would like to take it every morning. I found that it's been good to me. Health is great. I'm doing fine. It's one of the longest experiments I've ever done, probably the longest, but it's ongoing. And because... I'm changing other things all the time to see what works, what doesn't. I've kept that constant. So I would love to chat about, we've got a little bit more time here if you're willing, is I still probably get more questions about nicotinamide riboside than and NAD specifically than almost any other molecule that's sort of out there. We talked about I'm writing a book now, and part of that book, there's an appendix in it. And in the appendix, what I'm doing is writing a short section on sort of the drugs, supplements, and hormones that I think are most interesting. And so I'm including, of course, something on NAD and NR. I think I've identified 17 or 19 drug supplements, hormones that I want to address in this appendix. I would say that I get more questions about NR and NAD than all other 18 put together, maybe with the exception of metformin. So this is a topic that just continues to interest people I would say that my understanding of it is sort of at the six out of 10 level, which is enough to be dangerous and enough to be frustrated at the fact that it's not nine out of 10 level. And we talked about this again the first time we spoke, but let's go back for a moment and explain why do people even care about NAD or why should one care about their NAD levels? Well, I've talked a lot about sirtuins today. These are the protectors of the, the genome and the epigenome. They lose their activity over time. They have two things they require for activity, for maximum activity. We've mentioned resveratrol, which is an activator you can eat or take in as a supplement. That's the accelerator pedal on this enzyme family. The fuel that they also need, 100%, without it, they don't work, is NAD. NAD is a molecule that's in our bodies. We require it every second of every day to exist. Our bodies use it for chemical reactions. And without it, everything shuts down. And we're always making more and we're recycling it all the time. We have many grams of it in our body. It's probably one of the top two molecules that's important for life and one of the earliest that have ever evolved on the planet. The other one's ATP, which is chemical energy. NAD is also used to be the most boring molecule in biology. (laughs) You just had to learn by rote how it was used by the body and recycled, and it was just a bunch of chemical reactions. And it was forgotten about during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. In the 1990s, especially in the 2000s, it was discovered that it also acts as the body's signaling molecule and we think tells the body when you're exercised, when you're hungry, and is largely how calorie restriction works. So we think that in organisms like worms, flies, yeast, more NAD is better. When you give them more NAD, they live longer. And now the question is, is that true for humans as well? And the idea is that by either replacing lost NAD or boosting it to levels that you would only get if you run marathons constantly, you can turn on these sirtuin defenses and other aspects like DNA repair, proteins that need NAD. So again, we could almost be back in the paradigm that we potentially are with metformin and with resveratrol, which is it might be that the less healthy you are, the more you could benefit from supplementation or restoration, correct? I believe that because in our animal studies and other studies that people have done, the benefits of NAD and of resveratrol are seen predominantly in mice and humans that are obese or have a disease. And so they replenish what's lost. That said, if you boost the levels in a mouse of NAD, we published a few years ago, actually, no, it was about a year ago, that raising them above normal levels in an old animal gets you back to having a young cardiovascular system and they can run just as far as a young mouse. But when we gave NAD boosters to the young mice, they didn't run further, but they did if we exercised them and gave them the NAD booster at the same time. So it was the fuel, but not the trigger. I mean, you still needed to actually, it wasn't enough to get the expression basically of the behavior. In a three month old, very young mouse, but in a 50 year old, I would say that at least speaking for myself, I already have some deficits. I'm not as perfect or as healthy as I used to be. And so that may actually help more than it ever has before. All right. So let's talk about boosting it. 
So the first question is, David, can I just go out and buy NAD in a pill and take it? I think people sell NAD as a pill. <laughs> Let me reframe that. Is there a biological rationale for taking NAD orally? Very few people have studied taking NAD orally. What we've studied in humans and in mice extensively, maybe not as extensively as many would like, is giving precursors to NAD. Because most people take NAD intravenously. That's sort of the typical way it's administered in this country or elsewhere. Right, right. But there's this adage, and there's some evidence that NAD doesn't directly get into cells. It's a large molecule. There's some evidence that nerve cells take it up. But in general, it has to be broken down first before it's taken up into cells and reconstituted inside the cell. That may work fine. I've heard anecdotes that IV NAD is interesting, interesting results. Although you could argue that the placebo effect coupled with the actual physiologic responses one might have to nicotinamide could explain the quote-unquote reactions and the feelings that people have to intravenous NAD. But is it safe to say that the at this point in time, our scientific understanding is that intravenous NAD is not sufficiently making it into cells and, more importantly, mitochondria. Is that a safe assumption? Well, it gets into mitochondria because there's, a, at least if you believe the, this literature, there's an NAD transporter that pulls it into mitochondria. But not from the plasma. Right. Yeah, That's it the ha- would have to make it into the cell first. Yeah. I haven't seen convincing evidence yet. Now, I, I haven't read every paper on the planet. But I'm unaware of... Wait, you haven't read every paper on the planet? <laughs> Shame to. on you. I, I mean, know. come on. You don't come on this show without reading every paper on the planet. Well, I'll sell my kids and just read <laughs> The IV NAD needs a lot more clinical research. I agree with you. That yeah, it's- I'm a little skeptical on that. Okay, so then you said, okay, well, look, we've got this idea where we can orally take something like nicotinamide riboside, and I can go buy this on Amazon today. Yeah, you can. So NR for short, we're going to talk a lot about abbreviations. So NR becomes NAD how? Right. So NR is nicotinamide riboside. It looks actually chemically similar to how DNA is made, interestingly. That's what the riboside means. Nicotinamide is vitamin B3. So it's partly a vitamin B3, partly a piece of DNA. So that is a molecule that cells suck up through a transporter. So well understood. They stick on a phosphate. It becomes NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide. And then the cells turn that into NAD. So it's two steps. NR into cells to NMN to NAD. And then once it's into NAD, it's then recycled. It's turned into nicotinamide when a sirtuin reacts with it. Nicotinamide is abbreviated NAM. Yeah, typically. And that's a version of niacin or vitamin B3. Um, but many people ask me, can I just take a high dose of vitamin B3? And that, there's some interesting things. You can raise NAD by just taking vitamin B3, but you're missing out on the other components that the cell now has to make, which is the riboside, the sugar, DNA part, and the phosphate. So it's not surprising that other labs have shown that if your goal is to raise NAD in the body, at least in a mouse, it's been studied that niacin isn't as effective as taking NR or NMN. And there's actually reasons to avoid taking high doses of nicotinamide unless you're a cancer patient where it may help. But nicotinamide, we showed back in 2002, is a really effective inhibitor of the sirtuins, which are enzymes that you want to keep on. It's the whole point of raising NAD. And so we try to avoid nicotinamide while raising NAD. And actually, I hadn't thought of this, but it would be very useful if the field had a definition, which is the ratio of NAD to nicotinamide because that would give us an indication of the boosting, the gas to the engine versus the brake. Break, yeah. So right after you and I spoke last year, there was a paper that came out from Princeton, Josh Rabinowitz's lab, that looked at oral nicotinamide riboside. It was a tracer study that looked at mice where they gave them oral NR. And basically the question was, what is the fate of this? Where is it going? And what that paper showed was the liver took, because this was oral, of course, so that stuff gets, the NR gets absorbed out of the gut, presumably, and very quickly, everything in the gut makes its way to the liver first, hence it's called this first pass effect. And it was in the liver that most of that NR got turned into NAD. But the study didn't find that much NR made it out of the liver. In fact, what the study, if I recall, and now it's been so long since I've looked at it, but I think that they saw NAM, nicotinamide was up in the blood, but not nicotinamide riboside, which you presumably will still wanted some of that leaving the liver to go to get into other cells. 
because I'm assuming that you don't just need more NAD in the liver, correct? Wouldn't you want it also in the muscles or other cells? Well, yeah, you would. But there was a new study that came out that showed that if you give NR to people in a clinical trial, they could get NAD levels raised in muscle as well. Which study? This one was the... Just was posted on Biowalker. Yeah, yeah. This is the one that hasn't been peer-reviewed yet, correct? And it also showed the very high nicotinamide levels in the blood. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I think where the field is now is it's trying to get the NAD levels high without... Okay, yeah. That's the study that was using a very high dose of NR, correct? This is 1,000 milligrams? Right. Yep. Okay. So that's taking... On somewhat... Four times the posted dose that's given when you buy the supplements online. Yeah. It was a good study, placebo-controlled. They had... Average BMI was slightly higher. I think it was in the high 20s. Average age was, I think, up in the mid-50s. It was a higher age group where you'd expect some effects. So they proved at least what we had seen in mice, that you can get NAD to rise beyond the liver. How do you reconcile that? If that study demonstrated that there was an increase in NAD in the muscle, how did it get there? It couldn't have got there from the liver. The liver can't, to my knowledge, can't export NAD to the plasma, to the muscle. Does that imply that the dose potentially in the Rabinowitz study was not high enough for enough excess NR to leave the liver to make its way to the cells? Does it suggest, as at least one author has suggested, potentially there was a methodologic error in the Rabinowitz study where through freezing the samples, some of the NR was not detectable on thawing? Something that, by the way, I've asked people on both sides of this, and I'm getting conflicting inputs on this, by the way, uh, it's very difficult to sort of understand this. Again, I don't think people are bad actors here. I think it's complicated stuff and the assays don't lend themselves to necessarily working out every time. But what is your best explanation for how the thousand milligrams of oral NR in humans made its way into increasing muscle NAD. Well, it's getting past the liver. The NR is getting past the liver. Yeah. Right. Well, that's the simplest explanation. You've got to start hand waving and saying, oh, well, the liver then sends out an enzyme or a signal. From blah, blah, blah. I think that's possible, but. They didn't look in the mitochondria. We don't know if the NAD made it into the mitochondria, correct? They didn't. They didn't. But there are a couple of recent studies that show that it's very important for the NAD to go up in mitochondria particularly. Yes. And I don't think that's been demonstrated, has it? At least not in healthy. We're going to come back to the other study in a moment. If I recall, that study you're talking about showed a few improvements in certain inflammatory markers. Is that correct? Right. There wasn't much change with the NR. It was uh, some inflammation went down in the muscle. And if anything, mitochondrial markers of activity were lower. Were lower. That was something that didn't make a lot of sense. Although you could argue if the mitochondria became more efficient, perhaps you needed less activity, but you start to wonder if that becomes hand-waving as well. What's your interpretation of that particular finding? I don't have a good explanation other than that's what happens and that's what we'll see with other studies. I think we just need to check if other precursors do that because we don't know if it's a NR-specific effect or if the whole class of molecules will do that as well. That'll be interesting to see. But what I can say is that it's a surprise because Johan Ulrichs, who's over in Switzerland, and myself, and Matt Cableine even, who's shown in mitochondrial disease that NMN, and in some cases NR as well, does boost mitochondrial activity. Now, these are mice, and it may be unfortunate that humans are just not mice, and that's where it ends. I don't expect that. I hope it's not true, but the data won't lie. We'll do the clinical trials. They'll all be blinded. Uh, we've got many trials to go, but there are differences between NMN and NR. So curious to see if NMN has the same effect in humans as well. Those studies are ongoing. We don't have any good data just yet. And do you think that NMN would be best administered through a regular oral route, or would you want to do it through an SL route, somehow bypass the liver? Do you think that there are opportunities there with either NR or NMN to get even higher plasma concentrations, but without this compensatory rise in nicotinamide that potentially is harmful. Well, the SL route I'm asked about a lot, sublingual, put under your tongue, try and get it taken up by that. And let me explain why this is the case, because it might not be obvious if you're listening, because you might be saying, why would putting it under your tongue be okay, but swallowing it not? And the reason is when a person swallows a medication, it goes through from the stomach into the jejunum and the ileum, usually in the jejunum, which is the first part of the gut after the stomach, it gets absorbed. And that blood supply goes straight to the liver through this thing called the portal circulation. And so most drugs actually have to be designed with that in mind. 
either immune to the liver's metabolism or designed such that they're pro-drugs and the liver actually turns them into the right drug. When you're talking about putting something under your tongue, just like someone who, for example, carries around nitroglycerin, if they run the risk of getting chest pain, that drug gets directly absorbed into the circulation and doesn't go through the liver. So I just explained that for the listener to make sure they understand why that would be a potential advantage. Yeah. And also there's the complicating factor that our microbiome will love to chew up that NR probably. And there's an increasing studies showing that microbiome does eat up some of the molecules that we're ingesting. So that niacin part of the molecule, nicotinamide, it comes off pretty quickly. Even if a molecule in your fridge gets wet, you will start to lose that nicotinamide bond and it'll break off. And in the gut, some evidence that people have published and some haven't points to the gut playing a major role in how much this actually gets into the body and how. Typically, the public, they're not doing this for a living. They don't see the brutal struggle for academic survival going on. But now in the days of podcasts like yours, Peter, the public can actually see this play out. Now, that's good because the public can see what is the cutting edge of science and make their own decisions and hear experts' opinion. But it's bad because it makes it look like science is one giant food fight. But that's normal. Any new field will have these disagreements about, is your assay working? Is there a transporter taking it up? Is the microbiome destroying it? Do we need pro-drugs for the liver or can we just put NMN under the tongue? And we don't have any good answers, really good answers. I'm afraid to say that right now. But I can tell you what I see emerging. I'm happy to give my opinion. These are not facts. These are opinions. And I think we're all entitled to our own opinions, certainly not facts. My opinion is that the microbiome removes a lot of the nicotinamide from NMN and of NR before it's taken up by the gut. There are some studies that I've seen that aren't yet available that trace the movement of these molecules through an animal. We don't do those in humans typically because they're very expensive. You need to have isotopically labeled molecules, labeling different parts of the molecule. But then you can say, okay, where did the nicotinamide go? Where did the sugar go? And so I've seen some of that data. Now, it's not all in agreement, but if I was to summarize it, I think there's a little truth in everybody's results. I think there's truth that it makes sense not to put it all through the gut. It makes sense that if you put a lot in the gut, that's also going to work. Some of it will get through. There's some truth in that NMN gets broken down in the gut and then taken up by the gut and remade in the body into NAD because you're basically just pulling apart a you know, a three-piece Lego set, putting it through the screener and then reassembling it on the other side. That seems to happen too. But also I've seen data that looks convincing that some NMN and some NR gets straight into the body, goes to the liver, some goes beyond the liver into the muscle. And so it's messy. And there's probably never going to be one single answer to what's going on in the body with something this complicated. But here's the way I view it, is that certainly for the members of the public, I don't think they care if there's a transporter or not. They don't care what we want to disagree about a mass spectrometry assay for NMN. We'll figure that out. That'll come out in the wash. What's important is, does it work in a human? That's really all that matters. We know that these molecules do amazing things in mice to health and in some cases to longevity. Although potentially the most important study of this is not yet out yet, which is this ITP for NR in mice, correct? That should be the most robust analysis of NR, should it not, in mice? It is. So they use mixed strains. They use a variety of labs across the country. And so that's it's considered a standard, but it's not definitive because there are plenty of ways to dose, plenty of ways to deliver it, plenty of molecules in our kit. But if it doesn't work, it's another data point. And so with ITP, we'll see. Maybe it doesn't work. Johan Ulrichs over in Switzerland says if you give NR to old mice, it does work. I took stand the lifespan a little bit. We don't know about NMN. We're running that experiment in my lab. That's no secret. So we'll see if that works or not. We'll see. I think ITP is a good uh, start. What I find somewhat frustrating is that they've never asked me for advice on how to dose or what to give or anything. So Yeah, I was surprised as well that you weren't involved in that. Now, what you're basically saying is, look, in the end, does this stuff clinically work is all that matters? Because there's really smart people out there saying, show me the evidence that increasing intramuscular NAD matters? What if it's indifferent? What if this is true, true, and unrelated? Very recently, a paper came out looking at mega dose of oral nicotinamide riboside with terastilbene in patients with ALS. 
And it was a minuscule study that had as many dropouts as it had completers, if not more. But the gist of it was that on some what appear to be subjective measurements of quality of life, there was an improvement in patients with ALS taking this very high dose of nicotinamide riboside with terastilbene versus those taking a placebo. And what, they measured some cardiac function as well. So. I think they measured one pulmonary function called forced vital capacity, yeah. So, which is how much air could you blow, which would be a pretty important pulmonary function, which is one of the more important things that gets degraded in somebody with ALS. So the point is, for a very small study that obviously didn't have any hard endpoints, it looked like a success. But I can't help but think of what you talked about earlier what if this is another example of something where to see the effect, you have to be testing it in the most distressed organism? You don't like to talk about people in that terms, but a person with ALS is under far greater distress than you are. And it's certainly possible that in somebody who is that close to the physiologic limits of survival can actually see a small benefit, which I think is what that study, assuming that study is replicated, which of course is, to your point, that's the nature of science. I mean, each experiment is nothing more than a, a way to alter a probability of something likely to be true. But this would now make that case. But that was my reading of that study, which was interesting, but I want to see that in someone healthy. I want to see that in someone, for the same reason I want to know what metformin is doing in somebody who doesn't have diabetes. So someone really smart, I forget who it was on this topic once, speaking very specifically about this, there is so much smoke out there that you have to believe there's a fire, but I just don't know where it is. I think that's sort of how I feel. Well, with the resveratrol experience that I've had in my career and with NAD, it wouldn't surprise me if what you said is true, which is if you're in peak condition and you're young, you're not going to see a big effect. If you've got ALS or some other disease that gives you low NAD levels, or two ones are not working the way they should, then you'll see the benefits. That seems to be a theme that's emerging. If that's true, that's still good because we're not always going to be super healthy or able to run every day. There will be a come a time. And for the ALS patients, I'm sure they're rejoicing that this could be true. That study was the first real believable hint. I'm using my words very carefully. But that one looked like there may be some fire there in the ALS patients. Now, it was a p-value of 0.01 and there was some subjectivity. But if you look at the placebo versus the control, the placebos got worse and the drug experimental, most of them went up in improvement in terms of life measurements. You didn't have to squint to see that result, which was a nice thing. Now we'll see, I mean, again, you gotta remember that they don't have pure NR in this drug. It's a mixture of... It's NR with terastilbene. Yeah. And terastilbene is a very similar molecule to resveratrol. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, the study was, I believe they were using 1,200 milligrams combined. So it was 1,000 of NR and 200 of terastilbene. So that's six of those capsules that they sell. That's right. Now, the question is, is terastilbene milligram for milligram as potent as resveratrol? In other words, were those patients only taking one-fifth of the dose of a sirtuin activator that you're taking? Yeah, they would have been. So in other words, 200 milligrams of terastilbene is about the same as 200 milligrams of resveratrol? No one knows that, but resveratrol is just, again, these methyls. Resveratrol has uh, three little arms sticking out of two rings, and two of those are methyls in terastilbene. So it's a very similar molecule to resveratrol. Whether or not it's superior, I don't believe it is. I mean, some, there's some marketing that says that it's better. I haven't seen any data on that. If this study were done without the terastilbene, it might be more interesting because we could then, it's almost like you'd almost have a third arm that had either NR only or PT only. PT for the listener being terastilbene. Yeah. Well, that's the best way to do an experiment, but it's probably yeah. an extra few million dollars to do that.